Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. I am Winsome Wade from the Global Science of Learning Education Network. We're so glad you joined us today to hear from this great panel of speakers on using science of learning to disrupt structural inequity across the world's education systems. Our session today is scheduled for 90 minutes with presentations and interactions among the panelists and with you, the audience. Today's session features the book titled, The Science of Learning and Development, Enhancing the Lives of All Young People, which is edited by Dr. Pam Cantor and Dr. David Osher and published by Rutledge. You'll hear more about the book later. We have a full agenda today. Please use the chat feature to share your comments, your questions, your thoughts throughout the session. And do use hashtag G-S-O-L-E-N to share on Twitter and other social media. You can also find us on YouTube by searching for Global Science of Learning Education Network. And please visit our website for, for other webinars and for resources. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Pam Cantor, Dr. Zoretta Hammond, and Dr. David Osha, editors and authors of the featured book. I'm also so pleased to welcome today's respondents, Dr. Thamani from the University of Limpopo, South Africa. And by video, we have Dr. Rincon Gallardo from the Michael Fullen Enterprises in Canada. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to today's moderator, Dr. David Osha. Again, welcome everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us from across the world. Um, it is my great privilege to be able to initiate and also to facilitate this panel that is built around a collective product of many people, many authors. Uh, Zaretta, Pam, and I happen to be three of the authors, and Zaretta and I, and Pam and I, had the good fortune of being able to edit the the, the work. Um, we. It's also fitting that we are starting today on a day after the U.S. honored a man who they canonize and at the same time do not follow, um, Martin Luther King, who, like his contemporary who was also assassinated, M Malcolm X, learned so much from the Global South and also to some extent influenced the Global South, um, that what I will do is try to tell you a little about the book, um, set the context, provide a, a quick sense of the science of learning from 2002, from where we are right now in 2022, and then pass it off to our two speakers. And then I will come back, use the remainder of my time to do some framing conversation and then lead to our two discussions. And then you will participate. Um, I should have, first, let me just tell you about the book. Um, it's the science of learning and development. And I think that word development is very important in terms of how this effort was conceptualized because of the fact that development is inextricably linked to learning. And at the same time, development takes place in ecological systems that involve history, that involve culture, that involve macro forces that all affect what people are doing. So as we think about using the science of learning is, as I think many of you know, it's important to really understand the developmental context as well. Um, you have a link to the entire book. The good news is that two chapters are available today. One is the chapter that Zaretta Hammond wrote and, and, and the other is a chapter that is the concluding chapter that Pam Cantor and I wrote together. And my beginning will actually be coming much more from that chapter than what we'll hear later on. Um, that the agenda you've already heard, but basically I will start, um, frame some issues, um, lead to Pam and Zaretta, come back, then we'll hear from Dr. Thamani. And then because Dr. Rikan Galdoro was not able to be with us, he ended up videotaping something that I had the good fortune of listening to yesterday and it is wonderful. So not only is it worth waiting for, but at, what's more important is the purpose of this is not for us to talk to you. It's to initiate and continue a dialogue. And it is to learn from you 
particularly people in the global south, but also people in the remainder of the global north regarding how we can do this work in the different contexts that we work. So now let me move to the historical moment and just say that we are at a point where there is an exquisite paradox and tension between both a set of negative trends that have been exacerbated, amplified by COVID, and at the same time, positive tre trends that hopefully we can let leverage. The negative trends include increased inequality, the environmental degradation and its consequences, will which will continue to push people together and create all sorts of tensions, economic disruptions and displacements, intellectual and systemic fragmentation, skepticism regarding science and its misuse, part of which has been earned by the misuse of science in the past, and rising ethnocentric nationalism in many places and tribalism in many places, including the US. Um, and there are positive trends though. Over the past decade, there have been major advances in sciences and me methodologies related to learning and development. Even ones that can enable us to really collect and use um, qualitative data and the voices of people who have the lived experience. There's no longer an excuse to say you cannot collect this data systematically. Um, the, these developments include the syntheses that we are presenting a little today and building upon, as well as work that many of you have done. Um, there's also been advances in the conceptualization and under, understanding of individual co and collective thriving, equity, well being, resilience, and their importance. And I'll draw a little upon that and work I've done with colleagues as well. Um, and there is a transparency, a translucency an obvious nature for the need to change. And on the one hand, as the call for the webinar said, COVID has affected all of us. At the same time, while it has exposed the gaps, it is really important to understand that what COVID has shown is what many people in the global South and in what Paula Freire once talked about as the third world in the global North as well, have been experiencing for decades and for centuries, and, and, and I would even say in some case, and probably millennia. Um, okay, so some quick observations. Um, one is that about growth and change. Experience, culture, and opportunity structures feed and frame change, both positively and negatively. Motivation, identity formation, agency, meaning making, drive and moderate change in development, including the sustaining of privileges and subordination. Here, my subtext, the science of learning and development has an optimistic side. It also has a cautionary side. And the cautionary side is you can screw up as much as you can do good. You can press down as much as you can help people use the, the work to attack oppression. Experiences, relationships, and environments, and how we interpret them deeply shape how children and adults learn, develop, and act adults as well as children. Relationships within these contexts and collective processes of meaning maker, making are key drivers of change and innovation, but also of reaction to change. Social support, the importance of adult and peer social support for young people as well as for adults. Adults particularly need support so that they can be committed to all children and youth and have the capacity to attune with them, to buffer their stress to be culturally humble, competent, and responsive in their work with the young people and their support of the young people and of families and communities, to support children's cognitive, social, and emotional development, and to be able to provide alone and together with other adults and young people, instrumental and emotional support. Um, one of the lessons that you'll hear from Pam as well is resilience is possible, thriving is possible but it depends on adaptable, caring, supportive relationships. It depends on well-being, agency, and groundedness. It depends on strong social and environmental competence uh, supports. There may be an error typo there, I apologize. And it requires safe and supportive environments that are also scaffolded to support people. And lastly, before I pass it on to Pam and then to Zaretta, 
when we're reading the science of learning and developments, it's important to understand the inextricable links between and among social, emotional, and cognitive development, individual and collective well-being and ill-being, social, cultural, and historical context. Um, it's important to read and use the science of learning development with attention to historical, social, and cultural factors that affect how children and adults learn, develop, and coach, how we can work for change and also undo it. And with that, I have the great privilege to pass it on to Pam Cantor, a child psychiatrist who has worked all over the world and brought her great expertise to issues of trauma and to the science of learning and development over the past 20 years. Pam? Thank you so much, David. And it is just an honor uh, to be part of this group and to be with you all today. Before COVID, if I had had the opportunity to talk to you about human development, the development of the brain and learning science, I would have begun with this. There are 20,000 genes in the human genome, yet in our lifetime, fewer than 10% of these will ever be expressed. Well, what determines what's in that 10%? It's context, the environments, experiences, and relationships in our lives. Genes are chemical followers. They're little packages of protein covered with receptors on their surface that are triggered into expression by context, the environments, experiences, and relationships that we're exposed to. It's context that determines who we become, how we learn, and even the expression of our genes. The risks, but the opportunities in development and learning sit inside this one profoundly important point that there is no separation of nature and nurture, biology and environment, brain and behavior, only a collaboration between them. Developmental and learning science paint an optimistic story about what's possible because children's brains and bodies and abilities are malleable to experience because the human brain is a dynamic living structure made up of tissue that is the most susceptible to change from experience of any tissue in the human body. And the brain is malleable over time. Most of its growth happens after we're born. So there are multiple opportunities to catch up along the way. So there are really only three things I want you to know about brain development. The astounding malleability of the human brain, experience dependent growth, and the role of context. But the approaches we've taken to learning in schools have not fully challenged our assumptions about learning. Is it variable or does it fall into a bell curve? Or intelligence, is it defined by our genes or the context that drives their expression? Or skills, are they malleable or are they fixed? And talent, is it plentiful or is it scarce? Or human potential, what would any child be capable of under the right conditions? And if we know all of this to be true, should we continue to offer menus of labels and interventions or conceive of a response that reflects a new, bold, equitable purpose and design for education and learning settings, one that is encompassing, holistic, relationship-rich, not constrained by racist assumptions, rigorous and profoundly engaging of students' interests and capabilities. At the beginning of the 20th century, we didn't know what we know today about how the brain develops, how it becomes wired, and we built an education system that was never designed to develop the learner. If you think about that, an education system that was not designed to develop a learner, it wasn't designed for equity. It wasn't designed to unlock the potential in each and every child. For example, we did believe that genes were the drivers of who we become, including our intelligence. We believed that talent was scarce and distributed like a bell curve. So we built our system to select and sort. Today, we know talent is everywhere and there are many pathways to develop it. We believe that an average score on a test 
stood for an individual. And today we know that average rarely represents an individual. And we believe that a factory model with lots of memorization was a good and efficient way of educating kids. And today we know that agency and engagement matter far more to higher order skill building. And we believe that the potential of a young person was knowable in advance. And today we know we can't see potential unless we design the environments to reveal it. So today we can use what we know from the science of learning and development to unshackle our learning systems and unlock our learning pathways for every child, no matter where they are or where they begin. But our kids cannot do what we're asking of them without fuel, fuel that can ignite engagement, motivation, excitement, and learning, and an ability to surmount disappointments and challenges. This is what's coming next. What would it mean if all the places where children are growing and learning were designed using the principles of whole child design to meet each child where they are, to help, help each one develop to their fullest potential. What would that look like? Well, developmental and learning science paint an optimistic picture here, given what we know today about learning and the development of the brain. But we all have lived through a unique paradox in this time of COVID, where to stay physically safe, we've needed to be physically distant from some of the most crucial relationships in our lives. And this has taken a huge toll on families and kids. It's disrupted the very connections we need to feel safe, manage stress and fear, engage in learning and build resilience. Relationships are central to all development and learning. And this is because relationships are biologically mediated by a very powerful hormone called oxytocin. This is the hormone that produces feelings of trust, love, attachment, and safety. And that's not all. Oxytocin hits the same structures in the brain as cortisol, our primary stress hormone. Yet oxytocin is more powerful at the level of the cell and can literally protect children from the damaging effects of cortisol. This is why the effects of trauma are reversible. Not the events, but the feelings and the emotions are reversible. And relationships that are strong and positive that cause the release of oxytocin not only help us manage stress and offset the damaging effects of cortisol, it can even produce resilience to future stress. So when we speak about the human relationship, we're not just talking about being nice to a child. We're talking about a connection that is built through consistent caring, protection, presence, and trust. The kind that can make a child believe something about themselves that they couldn't believe until you entered their life. And not only that, the primary energy source for the wiring of the brain is human connection. The neurochemicals and hormones like oxytocin that are released because of relationships develop the motivation systems of the brain, the systems that encourage exploration, curiosity, practice, and fuel neurons, causing them to fire and connect to other neurons. And as the brain gets increasingly wired, this is called Hebb's law. Neurons that fire together, wire together. And as this happens, we become able to do increasingly complex things, whether it is reading, resilience, riding a bike, or engaging in learning. This is what I mean by fuel. In fact, in his 1984 Two Sigma study, Benjamin Bloom demonstrated that highly favorable conditions, building them into all the environments in which children grow and learn, will put many children on the path to realizing their fullest potential and all children on a path to equity of experience and opportunity. But his proxy for highly favorable conditions was an individual tutor. He found that he could move a student performing at the 50th percentile up two standard deviations through the experience of individual tutoring. But here's the thing, when he studied his data, 
he realized that the active ingredient that generated the outcomes that he got was not the content alone. It was the content and the connection, the nature of the relationship to the tutor. In fact, the human relationship and oxytocin are the most powerful example we have of positive context. And this is why relationships are central to all development and learning. So much of life is about building our muscles, muscles for resilience, adapting to change, or becoming a learner. And building muscle isn't easy. It's about practice, struggle, challenge, growth. I remember when I was a practicing therapist and a child would come telling me about the latest disaster that had happened in their lives. And all I could see was opportunity, opportunity for growth because error is opportunity. That's how our muscles get built, through struggle, surmounting a challenge, growing confidence. But sometimes in order to build those muscles, we will need to borrow some strength so we can stretch, take on a risk, build our cognitive load or cope with failure or disappointment. When I think of the system we have, error is seen as a mistake and the response to it for kids and teachers is punitive. The incentive that creates is to hide, not grow. But the bottom line is we can't do it for them. They are the actors. They have to do it themselves. And our job is to create the settings where this is possible. So let's imagine what would happen to the motivation, the engagement, the learning of every young person if every environment had a relationship that gave them this coaching, this mentoring, that pushed challenge, provided encouragement, and of course, celebrated successes. Think about the agency we would harness, the curiosity and learning we would ignite. Our young people would not only catch up and recover from the effects of this year, we will have created a big down payment on the learning settings we need to build for ours and their futures. This is the opportunity we have today and the inflection point that we are in. But what happens from here depends on what we decide to invest in. Thank you all so much. Turning it over to Zaretta. Thank you. Um, and I want to pick up where Dr. Cantor left off. The idea of relationships are so important. When I do my work with as a teacher educator, with teachers, with instructional coaches, with school leaders, what we are looking at and thinking about is this notion of how we use the science of learning as a disruptor. And that's what I want to talk about. I'm going to pause and just share my screen. That show. And I do think when we start to reimagine education and think about how we can serve the most vulnerable students, those that are struggling, those that have been marginalized, the science of learning really does provide this path by doing two things, by creating the kinds of environments that Dr. Cantor talked about, but also by looking at what we're doing within the instructional core. What does cognition look like? So the information she just shared about the nature of that relationship in one-to-one -one tutoring is important, but what do you do with that relationship? We're not just trying to be a cheerleader, but we're looking at ways in which we can help students grow their cognition. If we are actually going to get on the other side of COVID, disruption, then we are going to have to make sure that we empower all students to be powerful learners. And that is definitely what the science of learning um, provides us, right? The, the sold alliance offers these eight elements. And what I want to do is talk a little bit about three of them and how these three actually help us think about what we're doing within that instructional core of the classroom when we're close in with a student we're not just cheerleading we're understanding that the brain is malleable that it actually can grow and how we are helping them make meaning is one of the key things so integration the cognitive the academic the social and emotional brings all of that together 
sometimes I've seen us go the route of just relationships, like relationships will cure all important, necessary, but insufficient by itself, because the point of getting students to struggle means disrupting the way inequity for large numbers of historically marginalized students has played out across systems. And this is what we're talking about. How do we use that science of learning as a disruptor? And it means empowering students. And that's where the agency comes in. If the student is feeling unsafe, intellectually unsafe in an environment, that malleability can't be leveraged. Instead, we really have to be thinking about how we, for some reason, my, my slides are not behaving. And I am going to, here we go. Thank you for <laughs> your patience in this, because I think this point in this slide is a really important one. Through the science of learning, we really want to help vulnerable students strengthen their capacity to leverage their schema, right? Students come with something. So when we start talking about interrupting inequity, what we're talking about is this notion that students don't come with anything. How do we leverage what they know? Building cognitive structures. How do we do that as teachers? A lot of our teacher education programs don't show us how to do those things. And so part of what we need to be able to do is build these capacities in students so that they can process new content independently. So regardless of the pandemic uh, continues to disrupt learning, students should be able to learn at home in their communities, what other networks and groups that they're in. We can't assume schools are the only place for student learning. The relationship, the context, learning is happening all the time. This is why when I talk to them about culturally responsive teaching, the teachers and leaders and coaches I support, we're talking about bringing those two together, a high trust, low stress environment that gets that brain calm and ready, that integration that we talk about so that they can process information. The building of information processing systems is part of that malleability. It's part of that meaning making so that learning for understanding builds those structures that allow students to learn wherever they are. They are not dependent learners in that sense. So the question is, who do teachers need to be in order to develop the skills, dispositions, and capacities of cognitive thriving, particularly in light of past inequities? What I want people to understand about this work, particularly when I see it on the front lines in the classroom, is there is a way in which we are focused on the strategies or brain-based activities or processes when we have to put the student as at the center. How do we help the learner become more powerful in their ability to accelerate their own learning? That means teachers have to be able to actually be the personal trainer of students' cognition. But as we move into that area, we have to guard against the science of learning being weaponized to maintain inequity. Now, we think we're trying to move in the direction of equity, but there are um, elements of our systems that are hardwired that we really do have to pay attention to deficit thinking about who students are and what kind of information they come with or their intellectual capacity. And as Dr. Cantor said, this idea of racist notions that some people are of low intelligence or some people don't have the capacity, we'd like to think we've moved beyond that. But unfortunately, those sorts of ideologies persist. So we have to be able to use the science of learning, not just in sharing the research, but actually showing how this can move students toward cognitively independent work. So being able to move beyond superficial applications that just reinforce compliance of student uh, learning and move them more to that cognitive growth. I want us to think about it in this way. We want to be able to scaffold student learning so that that developmental part happens. Students over time are getting to be more powerful learners. 
So the image on the right is typically what we do now. We scaffold to provide access. This leads to that kind of pedagogy of compliance that we see. We, have, we may bring the science of learning into our classrooms in a superficial way, project-based learning, hands-on activities, but the scaffold is temporary, just like the scaffold of trying to paint a building. Once it comes down, the student cannot get to that level of intellectual uh, processing by uh, uh, themselves. Instead, what we need to do is think about it like we're building tunnels. This kind of scaffolding actually creates a new neural pathway so that once it is done, the student can go back and forth. We have the new neural pathways. We have myelination that al allows the student to, to do higher thinking and processing uh, at greater accelerated rates, make connections, get to that learning for understanding point. But that is because they are in a safe environment they are allowed to um, engage in productive struggle. They've reframed errors as opportunity and information. But that means that we know as educators how to do that, how to create those environments. So being able to think about this in terms of a relay race, we need the policy parts. We need the, the larger uh, uh, overview. But we also need to be thinking about how will this translate into the instructional core? What will those relationships look like during learning? How do we reimagine, reframe this work? So I leave you with this idea of disruption, right? Disruption is not just, you know, let's get angry and shake our fist at kind of the inequities, but where do we need to rethink? What do we need to reinvent? What needs repositioning within the instructional core so that in addition to the relational pieces, we are leveraging those to bring in the cognition and they are not separated. The cognition brings emotions and how do we help students navigate that, particularly if they have been historically traumatized. This allows us to start to think about how we can use the science of learning to decolonize the process of education and education systems around the world. Thank you for letting me share that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very, very much, Zaretta and Pam. Um, I think you can see the richness of both of their thought and thoughts and how important that is to our work. And I think the relay image at the end is really important. Coming from a country that often used to lose Olympic um, relays, even though it was very, very the fastest people around because people could not attune them to themselves in the moment where their adrenaline was high, but at the same time, their attunement was low and batons were dropped. And working with young people is, and adults and working for change is always the ability to adapt in the moment, as well as to build those tunnels that Zaretta is talking about. So I want to talk for a few minutes about framing the discussion in terms of appropriation and use of the, what we've talked about to really develop systems and chain practices that support robust equity. It's important to help adults within the context that you've heard so that they can attune, can they can support, and they can collaborate with children in a culturally responsive way. And I'm emphasizing the collaboration because this is not just adults supporting young people. It's young people being able to support adults and together to engage as well as be engaged by adults. The importance of promoting individual and collective well-being agency and groundedness. I mentioned conceptualizations of robust equity. I won't elaborate, but in the conceptualization, it well-being is not just individual, it is collective. We all always are affected by those people who are around us. We make meaning with and from the people who are around us, not just those key people, but everybody as well. And I think it's really important when we think about learning and development to really think about peers, to think about siblings, to think about the family, to think about the tribe, to think about the community. I also want to just call out for those of you who are researchers, the implications of this work and also the, the last chapter that Pam and I wrote. 
and what Zeretter has said in different ways, and people who are who co-authors like Carol Lee, who is also on this panel. It's really important to really address epistemic injustice, including whose voices are privileged and heard and research and in research syntheses. We've learned a lot from what we've done on the science of learning and development in the US and in the West, largely based on current empirical data. It's also important to include other voices from across the world to further elaborate that, both in terms of how we can do things for everybody, how we can do things in particular contexts, and, and what we should not be doing. And going back to researchers to also address self-consciously but creatively privileged sustaining frameworks and theories that reinforce, that legitimate, that normalize privilege and colonization. To give you just two examples that we call out victim blaming. Look at somebody who's doing poorly and then figure out what they should be doing so that they could succeed rather than looking at the context that really oppresses and creates their victimization. Or doing a silver bullet and then stopping it saying, okay, we've now given people the penicillin is going to work. And at the same time as the context has remained the same. And genetic determinism. On the one hand, as Pam said, the story is in genes, but there is also another story that people talk about. And it is the talking about genetic determinism. The story as Pam talked about is about epigenetics. It is about the fact that it is not genetics alone. It is what happens to us as we experience environments, as we ex experience and make sense of the support we have. And lastly, I now want to introduce our two discussions um, because the purpose of this event is in part to start learning even more from the global south. I've had the good fortune of working in many places and what I've learned in places like South Africa and what I've learned from colleagues in Mexico to the places you'll hear about today have really informed my work, my thinking about collective thriving, for example, but and also to learn from work in other countries and from work done in two th since 2017. The syntheses that we build upon are really powerful. I think we all did a good job. They also were based on knowledge development that was accumulated up until 2017. And this is work we have to continue to develop both as scientists and as practitioner activists. And lastly, to to ex extend the ongoing discussions and collaborations around learning, development, and robust equity. And with that, it is my privilege to pass it on to Professor Thamane. And after he completes his present discussion, what will happen is we will then have a video presentation, and then we will open it up for discussion with you. Dr. Thamane. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, for this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, um, let me take this opportunity to, to say thank you to the organizers of this webinar, uh, to be invited to be part of the participants of this big book, let me call it a big book, and um, when you read it, you just go on and on because it's not only informative, but it is also uh, entertaining. And once you, you have it, you don't want to stop reading it. I have uh, just a few reflections uh, from, the, from the book. I don't want to attempt to give a summary of the book. It will be very difficult for me to do so. But I want to share four ideas uh, as I reflect on this work. And uh, let me start there, start with the advent or the appearance of COVID-19 
the COVID-19 pandemic. I think this book came at the right time when the world over is struggling or thinking about how to best navigate this pandemic, especially for, for schools. Uh, those schools that are even more affected by this pandemic are those that are in the global south, like South Africa. Uh, when the COVID entered the scene, uh, it exposed many uh, inequalities, which were always there, but were somehow hidden. And they, become, they became even more clearer, or we saw them magnified. Uh, and for example, uh, we realized that there were kids who did not have computers in their schools. And when we wanted to go online, we found that it was not difficult, it was not possible. Some did not even have um, internet connectivity in their areas. So COVID exposed these maladies, these problems that are uh, pestering education in the global South. And this book is opening a window of opportunity for us to think about how to approach teaching uh, when there's COVID in the, in the house. And, uh, but we can also, but now before I, I move out of that, I wanted to say, but there are also advantages that COVID has highlighted. Uh, for example, we have started teaching um, when, when, when students are at home. Uh, we were engaged in what you call collaborative online international learning coil. I think most of us will be familiar with it. And I think the advent of um, the COVID-19 pandemic opened doors for us to see, oh, we can, we can actually teach from being uh, away from school. We can learn after hours. And I think the book is, is encouraging us to see learning as not happening only in classrooms and that learning can happen outside the classroom and people can learn from home. Uh, whoever imagined that I would be speaking on this platform in South Africa when it is six o'clock in the evening and you in America are in the, in the midday time. And it is these things that are saying to us, we should begin to think in new ways of about teaching and learning, uh, taking this advantage. And I think the book also encouraged that cross-border collaboration, interaction between people of different uh, kinds. This year, I had an opportunity to, to teach students uh, from Belgium. Uh, and the, my colleague, the other side, had an opportunity to interact with our students from the University of Limbobo. And it is, this kind of collaborations that are bringing new meaning uh, to teaching, uh, expanding the meanings and boundaries of teaching. Uh, as we take the second thought, the second idea is that uh, for a long time, uh, teaching has been dominated by positivism, uh, established sciences, uh, that that neglected the human the human aspect the human part of 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 knowledge of learning and this book uh, also brings to the fore the importance of humanistic approaches uh, to learning that is learning is not about is not about objectivities or objects or non-living things but learning can be a life. And in particular, 
the importance of language, the language of learning, the importance of considering context, considering culture, and so on and so forth. And I found this to be a very important contribution to how we understand uh, learning, uh, uh, which, which, which is not restricted to science or hard sciences, but can also use science as well as humanities to expand learning. Uh, this book is telling us that uh, learning has been in progress. There are uh, remarkable progress. Uh, the, the, there is a remarkable progress that has been made about learning. I mean, when you go to uh, proponents of different kinds of way we teach, uh, scholars have advanced education. But I think what has been lagging behind in the advancement of learning is that uh, learning has been taken in discrete, in boxes, in packages that are not related. And the book is attempting to introduce the importance of uh, cross-cultural disciplines, disciplines able to support um, one another in advancing development and learning. Uh, what Pam was saying about the brain, I find it very fascinating because I never thought that I would think about how the brain functions and, up and, and bring that into the classroom. And I think this kind of pulling, uh, leveraging uh, learning uh, through across disciplines, it can, also, it can only improve the advancement of, of learning and development. Having said that, uh, I want to bring the, 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 the fourth idea. Uh, what do we know uh, uh, from the South until now? Uh, what can the, the South offer? Because I think for a long time, knowledge has been construed to be coming from the West, Europe, maybe even the US. And very, people, very few people have considered that they can learn from the South. And I think the book, this book on the science of learning and development is underlining the importance of, uh, as I reflect on the book, I, I now see that we cannot have one, one source of information or knowledge that is the knowledge and that we can learn from other methodologies. We know the, the fight between the quantitative or qualitative versus quantitative approaches to knowledge creation uh, has been going on for, for years now. And I think this book is reminding us that that, that, that fight or that battle, that struggle is not necessary. Because, uh, and that when we say decolonization of the, of, of the curriculum in South Africa, there, there are calls about decolonizing the curriculum. Uh, and I think this book is saying to us, we don't, know to, we don't need to throw the, the baby with the water. We don't want to throw away anything from the North. There's much we can learn from the North and there's much we can learn from the South. And this approach, this book is telling us that we need to learn from the qualitative researchers. And as much as we want to learn, we need to learn from the quantitative researchers. We need to learn from the South in as much as we can learn from the North. And this is what this book is telling me that uh, we can learn more from the others. Let me just quickly 
dash into decolonization, uh, maybe versus internationalization of education, higher education, where I'm working in. Uh, the, the, the chapter on equity uh, has uh, invoked in me, I've seen that um, the, this book is, is telling us that uh, issues of equity, issues of context uh, in the debate about decoloniality or decolonization are, are very, very important. We have done some work with, we are doing some work actually, it's still going on with uh, universities of Johannesburg, uh, Pretoria, the Western Cape on the epistemic act access and success of students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, we started this work in 20, I think it's 2020, 2016, yeah. Uh, but what we have, what I've noticed, the book is giving us some solutions. It's giving us some notes to, to consider how do we make students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, like those at the University of Limpopo, succeed when they go to educate to, to in higher education. And I think uh, the issues of equity, the issues of uh, if I were to to go to this slide, would say that cognitive justice, ecologies of learning, uh, which come from that chapter on focusing on equity, are highlighting, are uh, enriching our debate or our our study of of um, of edu uh, uh, education for the poor people and closing the gap between the the historically white students and, and historically black students. So <clears throat> I like a quotation which I've taken from uh, uh, David Swag uh, that successful learning uh, requires self-generative, generative, should be self-generative, we should be socially aware, we should be flexible, we should be psychologically resilient, and so on and so forth, if we are to succeed. And I think this book uh, and, and the, the, the articles that are, are, are coming from this, uh, in this area will enrich our study of epistemic access and success for the students. In conclusion, I would say it is very difficult uh, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes like this to try to to pull together all the ideas, rich ideas that are, are, are coming out of this book. But I could say going forward, because I've seen many projects just remaining a, a talk, talk shop, people just talking with less action. Uh, this volume highlights the importance of thinking about teaching about learning, uh, about equity as fundamentally intertwined, which thing has not been underlined in uh, the development of teaching and learning so far. Uh, this is to me a very critical contribution of this piece of work. And this kind of work has not reached the South African shores especially in the northern part of the country where I am working. And I think it will do us good, all of us gathered here, not only to talk about these things, but to make them happen because action speaks louder than words. In, in, in our language, we will say kia lebo, meaning thank you very much yes. for listening. Kia Professor Thamani, 
Um, and your point about the fact that this is not just about understanding, it is about acting and acting together is very important. And now to hear from our second discussant. Hi, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. I have to say I loved the book, The Science of Learning and Development, and I'm very excited to be here to offer some uh, reflections and some uh, uh, ideas uh, in response to the book uh, from a Global South perspective. One of the key merits of this book is that it, uh, it accomplishes a major feat, which is it um, manages to summarize and to integrate uh, in a relatively simple and elegant way, massive, massive amounts of knowledge and, and research around how and under what conditions people and children in particular learn best. Um, and that's, that in itself is a, a phenomenal contribution. Uh, the book also includes some comments on equity and implications for equity and practice that are very important, very relevant. In particular, I'm very, uh, very happy to see that um, the authors made, make the point that uh, the science of learning and development has to have an equity lens, that it has to acknowledge and confront institutional systemic racism and oppression. Uh, and that's a, a, breath of fresh air, a, a breath of fresh air uh, for me and for many, for many of us. Um, but let me, let me start then with some reflections um, about, about this book from a Global South perspective. The first thing that I believe this um, book makes clear is that what we believe and know about powerful learning and development and what we do in schools are two very different things. One um, key idea at the center of uh, my work as an educator, as an organizer, as a researcher, as an academic, as a scholar, as a consultant, is that learning is a practice of freedom. And in many ways, the book um, uh, is consistent, the findings in this book are, are consistent with this fundamental idea, learning is a practice of freedom. And as the book points out as well, especially uh, David and, and, and Pam in their closing chapter, that's not what school is designed to do. Schooling is designed to um, uh, with three uh, major historical functions. One is custody, the other is control, the third one is sorting. This is what schooling knows how to do very well. This is what the institution of schooling knows how to do very well, and it's designed to do. But when it comes to learning as a practice of freedom, it does not only, it, it is not only a, 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 an imperfect technology to cultivate it. It gets in the way of it uh, in, very, in very clear ways. So what if we are to take the insights from the science of learning and development seriously. We need to think that our schools and school systems will require massive, profound, and widespread cultural change. Nothing less than that. What we need is massive, profound, widespread cultural change. And throughout history, the mechanism that humanity has, has found and utilized to change culture in deep and fundamental ways and in a widespread manner, having social movements. So I have argued elsewhere that uh, we need to start thinking about and, pr and practicing educational change as a social movement uh, in the sense that we need to change the culture. And in social movements, we have the vehicle to change culture in deep, widespread and in, in, in a deep and widespread manner. So um, this idea of education of change as a social movement is actually not a, just a theoretical recuperation. There are multiple examples in the global south in particular that have managed to change in fundamental ways the nature of learning and teaching uh, in uh, some of the most remote communities, some of the most historically marginalized communities in their countries, and they have managed to do this at scale. 9,000 schools in the case of Mexico, over 20,000 schools in Colombia with Escuela Nueva, um, about 38,000 schools in the uh, southern state of Tamil Nadu in India with the activity-based learning um, uh, model, and uh, about 2,000 schools in, in Egypt, the community schools. So tutorial networks in Mexico, Escuela Nueva in Colombia, activity-based learning in India, community schools in Egypt, are examples of real social movements that have managed to transform the nature of teaching and learning in very fundamental, very powerful ways, and in ways that are consistent with what we find in, in the book, The Science of Learning and Development. They have managed to do it at scale as well, and they have done it through a me a mechanisms similar to what social movements uh, do. 
So um, in many ways, these examples from the global south, these are just, this is just a handful of them, but there are multiple innovations going on across the global south that are liberating learning in very powerful ways. And um, what, what these represent in my view are sanctuaries for learning. They're sanctuaries, they're sp spaces that are maintaining alive the human spirit, the, the, the practices that allow learning and development to flourish, especially in the most historically marginalized communities in the global south. Um, what these movements are doing fundamentally is to replace the grammar of schooling with the language of learning replacing the grammar of schooling with the language of learning. And that's what we have to do. Uh, the grammar of schooling is this set of rules and, uh, and, and practices and culture that uh, uh, predicate control and, 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 and impose control and sorting and custody. The language of, of learning, on the other hand, is all the practices that um, are consistent with what book uh, de describes about uh, from the science of learning and development, what learning is about, what learning is really about. And if I may use this metaphor of language and grammar, in many ways, what uh, the science of learning and development se seems to be doing is, uh, with, in relation to the language of learning, is to serve as a linguist. It is the study of the language. That's what the, the science of learning and, de and development has managed to do so far. Now, examining and measuring a phenomenon is not the same as being prepared and ready and able to leave it and to make it happen. And that's where I believe there's an important uh, uh, partnership to be established with the Global South and with many other initiatives, not only in the Global South, but also in the North that are already doing phenomenal work around liberating learning. I'm talking about uh, pro initiatives such as Big Picture Learning in, in the United States and across the world. So the schools and networks that are um, yeah, innovating around pedagogy with the new pedagogies for deep learning initiative that Michael Fuller and Joanne Quinn have been have been leading for some years now. Um, but what we what the science of learning and development again has done is to start to decipher what are the core uh, mechanisms and rules of the language of learning. But again, knowing, uh, explaining, and understanding something does not conduce immediately to knowing how to produce it or how to create it or how to live it. And again, that's where I believe there's a lot of uh, potential for partnership between those who advance the science of learning and development in the global south. Um, some ideas here to, uh, to, to, to stimulate uh, reflection and conversation. I'm hoping, of course, that this is just a first uh, po point of contact, but that, but that we will maintain an ongoing conversation around this important issue of how to bring the science of learning and development to, uh, to the service of liberating learning. Uh, so the first one is uh, I invite all of those who, who are advancing the science of learning and development of, to, of engaging and learning about the Global South as learning partners, not as condescending experts, but as learning partners. There's a lot to learn from those who live the language of learning, not necessarily those who explain it, but those who live it, those who are, who are already making it happen. So engage as learning partners. Now, one of the things that the science of learning and development is making clear is that there's really no defensible um, theory behind how schooling operates and what kind of things they're doing to try in the, in the name of learning. It is indefensible. And I think part of the work of the science of learning and development is to contribute to make it uh, to make it indefensible, to, to make uh, the contradictions of schooling um, very clear and intolerable. At the end of the day, we will not change what we are willing to, to tolerate. And part of our work then as, as, as scientists is to make sure that it becomes intolerable to see and to be part of a culture uh, of schooling that is crashing the imagination, the capacity, the joy for learning in, uh, in hordes and millions, millions of students uh, across the world. Amplify the visibility of power, powerful work already underway. I think that's a, that's a very important thing that uh, those who advance the science of uh, learning and development can do. Help leading practitioners see and understand their practice better. Just offer a mirror and the lens of science of learning and development to understand what, what they're doing better. Uh, help identify some possible blind spots as well. I think that, that would be a very important contribution. Um, organ and very importantly, help organize to change what gets in the way. We need to change the grammar of 
schooling. And that will require massive change, culturally in classrooms, but also across entire systems. Um, organizing to change what gets in the way may be another important contribution, another way to engage with the Global South and leading practitioner. And finally, disseminate the science of learning and development in ways that are consistent with the findings of the science of learning and development, not through lectures and conventional uh, teaching, but through uh, learning partnerships with uh, those you engage with. This is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. And I really look forward to the continued conversation on this very important, um, very important field. Thank you. We are on our schedule. We have 20 minutes to co-learn together. And I open this up to everybody, our panelists, but also anyone in the audience to make a short point or to ask a question and to take us further. I wanna pick up where Santiago left off because I, I am in so many discussions like this these days that right now I think the shared commitment has to be around elevating pe people and places that are doing the work on the ground because people are asking the same questions. How do I start? How do I change something? How do I cope with this barrier? I'd like to suggest that we in our audience and the G Solon community look at the five biggest problems that people are having who want to do the work on the ground and elevate the solutions that people have found so that everybody doesn't have to start from scratch, everybody doesn't have to start from a blank slate um, and, and gets, gets that leg up. So I wanna piggyback on that. And um, the idea of information is not transformation that our last discussant uh, shared with us, right? The idea that we can talk about these things, but bringing it down to that level of actual change um, I think, as Pam said, we want to show the examples, but we want to also make sure that we're doing it right. We have a tendency to want to scale things immediately, and then we go to strategies, not students. So continuing to understand what do we need to do differently in terms of teacher education, I think is going to be a really important piece, right? What needs to go in terms of this is, you know, not sound practice what actually needs to come in. So I think part of what we need to be able to do is create some uh, lab opportunities for people to go in. How do you move it from, ooh, this is you know the traditional pedagogy of compliance, grammar of schooling, and what is that change process to move it toward a more thriving? There's so many moving pieces that I think part of the challenge is going to be not trying to go too fast, but to go deep. So we know what the changes are. We've, we've seen them happen for students, not just, you know, teachers, give me a new strategy and, and kind of call it, you know, whatever newfangled thing. We've seen this with social justice and I love the idea of cognitive justice. That means you actually have to build student capacity before you can say, hey, we know how to do this. Um. Well, Ajita, if you have a question and you can verbally ask it while we're doing that, there is a question, David, from I think it's Jero Washington. How do we compensate the cultural difference between the changes needed in decolonized education within the oppressive or cultural differences between the countries and systems of the US? Yeah. Let me try to respond a little. And actually, I want to respond based on some work that Professor, uh, Professor Thamani and I and South African colleagues undertook about five years ago that we were not able to continue, where the goal was to really try to create the conditions, even in South Africa, where people who were working in very privileged spaces in some universities could really work and collaborate with people who were working in places like the University of Limpopo. And I think what's important to know is there always is both some commonality that we can take in every places, in every places, the underlying principles. And at the same time, the application is always different. It's different with every child. It's different in every classroom. It is particularly different in every historical circumstance. 
And what we really want is both to create schools that embody the practice of freedom, schools that develop critical consciousness, and at the same time, to know that it will happen differently in different places. And so I think we need always the ability to speak generally, but also speak specifically and learn from each other. And I just want to call out one of the co-authors that was is John Nesselrode and his point regarding the fact that on the one hand, you want to start as Pam Cantor said, by understanding individual trajectories. We all learn individually, but it doesn't mean that we can't look at commonalities across learning, across context. And so we have to be able to do something that's been harder in the West than in other places to both think about individuals and at the same time, simultaneously think about the context and, the, and who else they are co-acting with. There's a question from Beth Gamba. I'm gonna go ahead and read it. Uh, because COVID has revealed the scale of inequity more than ever before, could the ground be ripe to insist that the science of learning and development is the thrust of what we mean by high quality education as a civic right? How can we ensure that soul is integral to the definition of high quality? Any of the speakers want to take that? I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I think this is the idea of cognitive justice. When we start to uh, actually understand what is it that um, is going to lead to thriving. And right now, those definitions are too narrow. So when we say the you know high quality teaching and learning or high quality instruction, Typically, that's assessment, that's a, a test taking, that's compliance. We've thrown in a few, you know, 21st century uh, skills. But the idea of being able to grow your own brain power, being able to actually um, improve your ability to um, process information, giving students that kind of liberatory education is not just the content they get, but it is the skill and capacity, almost as if we're talking about, to use a metaphor, what we would expect when we're parenting a child, to get them to 18 or whatever that legal age is, to be able to be self-sufficient, to care for self, mind, body, spirit, and move through the world as they continue to grow and develop as an adult, but they have the basic tools and skills. We still haven't narrowed that, uh, not narrowed it. We still haven't articulated that, looking at that cognitive justice through an equity lens, because we've used the science of learning to justify you know, the deceleration of cognition for certain groups of kids. So being able to kind of uh, uh, expand that definition so that we really are talking about the most vulnerable students having the right to build their capacity and not just be in spaces that are about compliance. Other questions. So there's an earlier question. I don't remember from who, but we can maybe pull that one up and see if the panelists could respond. It has to do with how do we uh, expand the, the findings of the science of learning and development at scale through parent mm. or parent organizations. Um, um, Please, Pam, just, go ahead. Well, this I is Elijah. I hope somebody can hear me now. I've been trying to unmute from this. Page. Okay, as moderator, I'm going to let us go. Thank you very much for coming in. Please. Um, I'm going to come from the perspective of a disruptor now, quote and unquote, and flip this conversation between the knowledge exchange between the North, global North and the South, and the way we move this conversation and this work forward. Um, I spent half of my 68 years of um, education in the South, in the global South, and um, the rest in the global not. I'm now still in the global not as a full professor. In order for us to move this conversation to a meaningful exchange of thoughts and ideas and improve on this work in relation to working with the global south, I think the global north academia has a lot to learn in terms of um, the knowledge they need to know about the global south. 
the Global South is advantaged because the Global South already know your knowledge because that is the knowledge, you know, that, you know, is being propagated and so on. So any academic who is coming to the South to learn must be open-minded and be ready to learn, not make an assumption that whatever I'm carrying from the Global North, I'm just gonna come and bamboozle and do what I need to do, and then that should be right. Should come with an open mind to know the context, to know the students we are dealing with, to know how teaching and learning occurs in those environments, to know what are the emerging theories within the context of that environment and the geographical space, in order for the two knowledge to match and produce something, you know, reasonable, something learnable by both sides to improve teaching and learning and the science of teaching and learning. That's just my comment. Thank you. Um, Pam, you will respond. And then Kai Ming, I see you can have a, qu a question, but Pam can't do first. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say two quick things. One, um, to the comment that was just made, there are reasons why the Global South has been better able than the Global North to scale good things. And we in the Global North have to look at that. <laughs> that if you were gonna go and scale the kinds of things that we're talking about, you're gonna have a much easier time than you will have in the, you will have an easier time in the global south than you will in the global north. The global north is a tightly wound knot of assumptions in politics. And nobody who wants to scale anything in their right mind should start there. So I agree with the comment. There's much we could learn from the global south, but we have to be humble about um, how big the barriers have become in the global north. The other, uh, which may not seem related, is the comment about parents. Because of the enormous number of barriers in the global north, Personally, I become very interested in galvanizing parents with this knowledge. There's nothing like demand from a voter or somebody who's paying tuition to be able to say, this is what I want for my child. And I personally want to make it much easier for parents to verbalize what they want for their children. And that has to do with our messaging, that has to do with the concepts, but um, and there are organizations. One of my favorites is Learning Heroes, started by a woman named Bib Hubbard with a huge, huge in the millions following of parents. Um, thank you, Pam. Um, Kai Ming, I'm calling upon you now. Uh, my point is that they say certainly I'm almost echoing what Pam was saying. Uh, if I can refer to my part of the world, the Chinese communities, Japanese, Korean, and uh, you may include even Vietnamese uh, communities, then uh, in, apart from the school system, there is in one way or another, implicit or explicit a system, a system of teaching. And that allows the science of learning to infiltrate into the systems. And, and so, it, yes, I, I teacher education is important, but why should teacher change? And that requires a systemic change. And there is no institution of teaching in many places. You have institution of schools. So there is a layer of, uh, of educational community that has to put into place. Now, this is my observation. I might be wrong. That is why I say that the the uh, San, Dr. Santiago's cases in South America is very important. Let us look at why they happen, how they happen, and that will give us a lot of knowledge beyond individual learning. Thank you. We have about five more minutes. Does anyone else have any points that they would like to make? First, anybody in the audience and then the panelists. And I have one if I could, but I, I will defer. 
I'd like to jump in if I can, but I don't know if you can hear me, Winston. Miss Kevin. Yes, Kevin. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yes, we could go on for years talking about this, I guess. Um, just to agree with everything that's happening, including the challenge of scalability. When, when our organization had a chance to speak on the same platform, that's what we talked about. But I just wanted to quickly talk about the relationship with parents. I was just running a session this morning with our network. Um, and we had about four or five schools explaining how we're working with parents in extremely, really radically different ways. So the title was, we don't need to educate our parents because I get tired of that cliche. Yeah, they're pretty well educated already from what I've seen, some of them are. We need to co-create learning cultures with them. So we've been working with schools. So for example, through inquiry, talking to parents, through asking a few simple questions, inviting them in, questions like, one of the schools we're working in is in Ecuador. I'm based in Honduras. So I'm doing this thing on the ground in Central America. So the name of the school is Mine. It's built on the wishes of kids. So mine, yours, ours. So the question that kicked off a session with parents was, if mine is the answer, what was your question? In other words, what were parents looking for when they, when they, um, when they chose this school? Another question we explored was, what did you never get from school that you'd love to give your children? And otherwise, and then we have this portrait of a learner trying to describe the capacities of a, a whole human being. Here's what we'd like to give your children. What do you think? Um, we get parents telling their learning stories. We get them drawing the stories of their own schooling. Pick a story, pick a memory that shaped you as a learner. Draw the story for us. Now turn the story into a single word descriptor. Now tell us why you remember it and then write a message to the teachers. So the parents are writing from my story, dear teachers, please remember that every one of my children is different. And I love it when you treat them that way. And, and other kinds of messages, dear teachers, you're doing a great job in difficult circumstances, please keep it up. So I guess what I'm saying is we really have to shift from this notion that we are going to tell our parents stuff to inviting them in with open-ended questions and co-creating learning cultures with them. The other thing I'll say is we're having great success globally with schools doing this kind of work, but, and we've been discussing this with Winsome for months, I'm working in about 30 schools. There are millions of schools that need to shift. <laughs> As, um, as Professor Gallardo said, that schools are not built for learning. They're built for compliance. And there's huge vested interest in the North in keeping it that way, Pam. Uh, not just colonial interest, but full on financial interest. The people who sell the tests make their money doing that. The people who sell textbooks make their money doing that. The whole of the North is making its money, keeping schools the way they are. I only say that to say it. I'm just supporting what Pam is saying. This is a massive, massive problem. Just say anything we can do is our small global organization, Common Ground Collaborative, count us in on partnerships to share success stories, share our systems. But I don't think anyone on this panel thinks it's, it's going to be a short struggle. This is, this is, we have to be in for the long haul. As I pass it back to Winston to close us out, I want to add that in 2008, I had the privilege of leading the global evaluation of child-friendly schools. And we, when we ended up looking at our data and we tried to um, quantitatively, not just qualitatively, and we looked at what was the drive, the key driver of change in those places that really were more child-friendly, it was the active engagement and support of families and of children. I think the science of learning and development is about whole children, but it's also about whole adults having the ability to attune to children, attune to each other, and work for change in a world that is not necessarily just and easy to work in. And back to Winsome Wake. Thank you, David. Um, this has been awesome. And I feel the need to ask each of the panelists for one final word. I know we are running just a bit over. So I'm going to quickly say thank you to everyone. But Zaretta, uh, Pam, David, and uh, Dr. Fameen, one last word from each of you. Thoughts? 
No. Can I start? All right, no, okay, I will start. Just one word to kind of bring it back to One word, okay. (laughs) Create safe spaces that support freedom and learning. And mine would be, can I come in? Yes. Mine would be, let us continue to talk, but also let us continue to think about how to make schooling schooling better for children. Thank you. Loretta. Learning by doing, making sure that we are learning on the ground with families, with children in real time, not just talking. Thank you. Pam? I have to say that the themes of co-create, co-design, act, and the urgency of this is, is I guess what I put on the table too. It, it's never been more urgent. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. David Osher for moderating today for a great panel, uh, panel of speakers. As you know, the session is recorded. It will be up on the website at the Global Science of Learning Education Network in about 24 hours. We'll also try to post the PowerPoints as per the speaker's agreement. And we will also have the webinar uh, posted on our YouTube channel, again, in about 28 to 48 hours. Please follow us at the Global Science of Learning Education Network. And thank you so much for today's webinar. Have a great afternoon or day or night. Goodbye.